Hi, what's on the workbench today is an SV6301A handheld vector network analyzer by SysJoint. It has a frequency range between 1 MHz and 6.3 GHz. One of SysJoint's distributors, Chaligans, sent in this unit for me to do a review. I will leave a link to the product in the video description below, and be sure to check it out on their website if you are interested. Now, I just reviewed a NanoVNA-FV3 a couple months ago, and that was a quite capable NanoVNA. Curiously enough though, the V3 also has the exact same frequency range as the SV6301A I have here. So naturally, I wondered if this is just a coincidence or they actually are sharing some of the key components and designs. We'll definitely have to find out during the teardown later. I know most of my viewers already know what a network analyzer is, as I have done plenty reviews on these devices before. But just for completeness, in case you are new to the channel, a network analyzer can do amplitude and phase measurements within a frequency range and characterize both the transmitted and reflected signals. This is in contrast to a spectral analyzer, which essentially provides only frequency and amplitude measurements of the input signal while sweeping through the given frequency range. This VNA is huge compared to the V3, as you can see them side by side here. I'll put the actual dimensions and a few key specs on the screen here for your reference. As you can see here, it has a 7-inch touch screen, which is great for people like me with poor eyesight. The unit is actually quite heavy, as the case is made of iron instead of aluminum. In terms of the specified S11 and S21 dynamic range numbers, they are again very similar to the specifications from the V3. Before I power it on, I just wanted to show you guys what came with the package. The instrument comes in this semi-rigid carrying case. And because this VNA has N connectors instead of SMA connectors, you've got a couple of these N to SMA adapters. Interestingly enough though, the cables and calibration kit all have SMA connectors instead of N connectors. This means if you need to use N connectors, you will have to get yourself a set of N connector calibration kit instead. This is actually quite different compared to the SAA-2N VNA I have here. I have also reviewed this on the channel before. And as you can see, the SAA-2N also comes with N connectors, and all the accessories have N connectors as well. Anyway, this is just something to keep in mind. I do want to show you guys the firmware upgrade procedure first, as the firmware version on this unit was 0.50. And I was told there were some bugs in that version, so Chalicans sent me an upgraded firmware version. The upgrading process is actually very easy. Now on Linux, I had to boot into the UI and enable the USB drive first before I could copy over the latest firmware in the upgrade bin file. If you are using Windows, you can actually get to the drive directly from the firmware upgrade interface. There is an option there. I think it may have slightly different implementation of the flash drive functionality on this firmware update screen, and for whatever reason, Linux is not supported here. But Linux is supported once you fully boot up the device. Anyway, to boot into the firmware update screen, all you have to do is push down the control and function keys simultaneously while turning on the unit. And the update process is just a simple click away. Now, it does take a while, approximately 40 seconds, for the entire update process to complete. All right, now let's power it back on. As you can see on the boot up screen, the firmware version is now 0.5.1. The screen on this SV6301A is glossy, which makes it quite difficult to shoot. I'll try my best. One thing you will immediately notice is that we have a lot of options here on the main screen compared to the standard Nano VNA user interface. And in my opinion, this actually makes it easier to use as the commonly available functions are right at your fingertip. And that reduces the number of clicks you have to go through to get to the item you want. So for example, here I can turn on and off each display channel very easily just by tapping on these sections here, you can see. And if I wanna select more options, I can long press on the item. And you can see here, we have these additional menu items to choose from for more options, which we'll take a look later. The operation is actually quite intuitive. Besides going through the manual here or on the right-hand side, which we'll show you later, you can also touch the parameters you want to adjust right on the screen here. So for instance, if we want to change the start frequency, we just press on the start frequency and we can change it to say 10 megahertz. 
and you can see that the start frequency has been updated. And also it looks like by default, the number of points it is scanning is set to 501 points. And that's probably why the scan looks a little bit slow compared to the nano VNA devices we reviewed before. As by default, most of the nano VNAs were set to 101 points instead of the 501 points. But of course we can change that. So let me tap on it and we can change it to say 501 points. And you can see that the operation is very easy. Now this VNA supports up to 1001 points for each scan. While we're in this corner, another menu item you can see we can adjust is this power. You can see right now it's set to minus 12 dBm. And this is a neat feature that is unique on this SV6301A. It allows you to adjust output power from port 1. And this is actually a very useful feature if you're doing the S21 measurement on an amplifier, so you wouldn't saturate your amplifier under test. While we're still talking about manual items, let me show you a few unique and useful features on this VNA. If you go to the stimulus menu, of course, you can select the start and stop frequency. For example, here, you can set them right on the screen here. But here, we can also set the IF bandwidth, which is this button here. The narrower the IF bandwidth, the lower the noise floor, and of course, the slower the scanning speed but you have the ability to set IF bandwidth if you need to. And this is actually not available on a lot of the nano VNAs. So let's do the calibration first. Now for this demonstration, I'm just going to calibrate the entire frequency band from one megahertz up to 6.3 gigahertz. So let's select the start frequency, one megahertz. And right now we're stopping at 6.3 gigahertz. In practice, you will need to calibrate the frequency range you are measuring for the most accurate results. Now again, this is what I was mentioning earlier. Since the calibration kit came with this unit only has SMA connectors, if you want to use cables with N connectors, you will need to purchase the calibration kit with N connectors instead. I suppose you could first calibrate with SMA connector and then subtract an electrical delay that corresponds to the length of your adapter. Now we do have this electrical delay menu item here handy, but the flatness of the response will likely be different with and without the adapter. So you really need to have the appropriate calibration kit. Anyway, now let's do the calibration with the supplied SMA calibration kit. Now let me first turn on the Smith chart as we do need that later. Let me put on the adapter here. And finger tight. Now you could use a torque wrench, but most of the cases, finger tight is sufficient. So let's go to the calibration menu. Let's reset it. And when we calibrate, let's first do open. As we do have 501 points, so the calibration takes a little bit longer than your standard 100 points calibration. Here we have a short. And now it's load. And for our through calibration, we're going to connect these cables.
and now we're done. So let's save it to the default. And let me remove the cable so let's see how flat the calibrated curve is. And you can see, after calibration, everything looks beautiful. So let's first take a look at a few antennas I have at hand. The first one is this whip antenna, which has a operation frequency at roughly 840 megahertz. So let's take a look. Let's turn off a few charts so we can see it more clearly here as we don't need the return loss. And you can see we have this dip right here. So let's actually change it to a more familiar display. Let's change format to SWR. And you can see we have this peak. Let's just uh, zoom it in here at roughly 840, what was that? 848 megahertz. And of course, Given this setup, the ground plane is not ideal, so that's why you see the SWR is actually a little bit higher than usual. But nevertheless, you can see if I put my hands here, the SWR does come down a little bit, of course. It also impacts your frequency response. Next, let's take a look at the GPS antenna here. And for that, I'm actually going to go back and change the frequency range a little bit. So let's go back to the format, log mag. And I wanted to change it between 1 gigahertz and 2 gigahertz. And I just want to see how flat that frequency is, so whether or not we need to recalibrate it. And you can see we probably don't need to recalibrate it, as the S11 remains very flat. In general, though, you should calibrate every time you change the frequency range. Anyway, now let's go back to SWR. So now let me put on this GPS antenna. And you can see we have a very sharp response right around, let's just move the cursor here. Let me drag it down. So it's right around 1.54 gigahertz. I almost forgot, let me show you another feature of this VNA here. So while we're in this antenna measurement mode, I can go to marker and do sweep analysis. So for example, this is a band pass analysis. And you can see here, we actually have the cutoff frequency and also the bandwidth. It tells you that the center frequency of this antenna is 1.5 gigahertz with a bandwidth of roughly 10 megahertz, you can see here. And now let's measure the characteristics of this LC filter. For that, I have already adjusted frequency to be between 200 and 500 megahertz and enabled S21 as well. So let me put on my SMA cable. Let me put on the filter. And you can see the response here. So let's take a look at the peak. And it's right around 338 megahertz. And the last antenna I wanted to test is this waveform wideband MIMO antenna that I reviewed a while ago. And that operates between 600 megahertz and 6 gigahertz. Now, I have tested other VNAs with this antenna before. What makes this an ideal candidate for testing is that it has a very detailed data sheet with published performance data. So it is a great way for us to get a sense of how well the VNA works. But instead of using SMA cables, I wanted to use N cables instead because these are natively with N connectors. Of course, we have to recalibrate this VNA, as you can see, after removing the adapters, 
the curves are no longer flat. So let's do a calibration. So let's come to Cal, and I want to reset the calibration. And now I'm just going to use the calibration kit that comes with the SAA2N VNA. So let's do the calibration here. I'm putting on the open. Let's calibrate. And by the way, right now we're measuring two of the adjacent antennas. And if you recall, this is a MIMO antenna, so the adjacent antennas are orthogonally polarized. So therefore, they should have very good isolation. And you can see, for the majority of the part, we do have pretty good channel isolation at roughly minus 30, minus 20 decibels. And also, if you look at the S11 plot, that shows you the SWR of the antenna. Of course, this antenna does not cover the entire frequency band, but within the frequency band, you can see for the entire operation range, the SWR stays under 2, which is specified. And of course, there are some areas it's not covered by the frequency range of the antenna, and the SWR does pop up a little bit, but that's outside the operation range. So within the operation range, you can see the antenna behaves very nicely. For the last experiment, I wanted to take a look at the characteristics of a amplifier. And what's humming in the background is my HP493A traveling wave tube amplifier, which can amplify signals between 4 GHz and 8 GHz. Of course, this VNA only supports up to 6.3 GHz, so we're going to be measuring the characteristics between 4 GHz and 6 GHz. And this is what I mentioned before. In order to test your amplifier, first of all, you have to limit the input power. As you can see here, we have set the power output from the S11 port to minus 40 decibels. So that, number one, we don't saturate the amplifier. Number two, we don't damage our VNA as the amplified power coming in will be significantly higher. So now let me turn on the amplifier. We'll see what we see on S21 here. And you can see that S21 currently is out of range, but let me auto adjust it. So let's press S21. Let's do scale. Actually, we can probably come back here to auto adjust. Let's see, auto scale. And you can see we have some variations. Now, this is a very old amplifier, so I'm not surprised that the amplification is not uniform across the frequency range, but you can see here at the lower end, we have roughly 13 decibels amplification, and the higher end, we have 23 decibels. And you can see here is our amplification characteristics. So this VNA is going to be very useful if you are working on amplifiers. All right, let's take a look at the signal generation capability of this SV6301A. According to manual, you can generate RF signal up to 6.3 gigahertz, which is quite impressive. So let's take a look. To get to the manual, we can press stimulus, and we can press the signal generator option here. So you can see by default, the output is off. The output is, of course, multiplexed with the port 1. So let's uh, see if we can change a little bit here. According to the manual, the maximum output power is minus 10 dBm. So let's actually set it to the maximum output power here, 10 minus dBm. So let's uh, do that and let's enable the output. So let's take a look at a special analyzer. Currently, the Special Analyzer has a center frequency of 1 GHz, and we're sweeping between 900 MHz and 1.1 GHz. We also set the resolution bandwidth to 300 kHz, as you can see here. Now, the Special actually is a lot cleaner 
compared to what we saw in the nanoVNA dash FV3, which uses the same synthesizer. So I suspect there was some kind of programming issue in that design. So it definitely can be fixed by firmware upgrade. Although the main peak is a lot cleaner, we do have some of these spurious signals out here. And I don't like this one. This one is a little bit too high. I think it's only 40 decibels down from the peak. So not sure what is going on there. But let's just find the peak. So you can see right now we're sitting at minus 9 dBm, which is close enough. And now I have changed the output frequency to 6.3 GHz, and you can see that is captured on the spectral analyzer. We have the same 200 MHz frequency span, and also have the same 300 kHz resolution bandwidth. And again, you can see the phase noise is fairly low, but we still have these spurious signals out here, so that is not ideal. And because we're using a RG145 cable with N connectors, you can see the attenuation is actually quite small. And we are still able to get minus 12 dBm on the spectral analyzer here. In our next test, let's try to determine the length of the SMA cable that is supplied with the SV6301A. And I had measured these before. These are roughly 60 centimeters. So let's use the TDR functionality to test how long this cable is. Let me put it on channel one, rather port one. So let's enable the cable length measurement. And by default, you can see that the velocity factor is set at 70%, which is correct for the cable. And of course, we see a peak here. So let's uh, see what the peak says. It is roughly, you can see here, is 618 millimeters. That's roughly the length of the cable. Of course, we still have this adapter that extended the actual electrical length a little bit. So that is roughly in the ballpark. And now it's time for us to do the teardown. You can see this is essentially used as a two-board design. Before I disassemble the unit even further, let's actually take a look at the power consumption. Let me remove the batteries and take a look here. So these batteries, by the look of it, is 3.6 volts, 3350 milliamp hour battery. So that gives you the four hour runtime that is specified. Now, given that four hours runtime specification, you can kind of calculate it probably draws about 1.5 amps when in operation. So let's take a look at the measurement here. And for current measurement, I'm just using a lab power supply hooked directly to one of the battery holders. Now, I confirmed earlier that I could operate the scope with just a single battery. These batteries are essentially in parallel, but of course, with separate charging controls. Anyway, each of the battery is rated for roughly 3.3 amp hours, and you can see we are drawing about 1.6 amps when the screen is set to medium brightness. So two batteries give you roughly four hours runtime, which is on the shorter side, in my opinion. Given how much space they have here, they could easily utilize a higher capacity LiPo battery and provide much longer runtime, and I would have preferred that. Now, I totally forgot to mention when I was reviewing it earlier that the unit also has a stand at the back. You can see we can extend that, and this whole thing stands on the table like this. Now, this is a rather industrial looking, but it actually serves the purpose really well, and it's really secure. The board on top here is the RF board, as we mentioned earlier, and you can see here the RF board has these SMA connectors that are adapted to the end connectors that is facing the outside world. As I mentioned earlier, the supplied calibration kit and the cables are all using SMA connectors, so you essentially have adapted twice if you are primarily using SMA connectors. There is always some loss with each additional adapter used. And I think it might be better to either offer SMA or N connectors natively if I were designing it. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Now, after the top RF board is removed, you can see the main board. The main application processor is this F1C200S, which is an application processor based on ARM9 CPU architecture, and we have seen it used in many portable oscilloscopes I have reviewed on this channel before. Underneath the application processor is this MS90C385B, which is an LVDS driver for the LCD. 
The QFN chip here, marked with EA3036C, that is a power management chip and has three building bug converters that can generate three independent voltage rails. Towards the top, that is a windbound flash memory, and you can see the spy programming header right here above it. I assume that is for programming the memory chip, as this windbound flash memory supports the spy interface. And here is our touch interface flat flex cable with a built-in I2C touch screen controller. You can also see an 8-pin chip up here, that is the DS1302 real-time clock. On the other side of the board, you can see we have this micro SD card, and that is used for storing the screenshots and configuration values. Now, moving on to the RF board. By the look of it, the RF board actually communicates with the main board via some kind of serial communication. As you can see, we have the RX and TX markings on the connector here. The microcontroller used in the middle, that is an HC32F469, which is an ARM Cortex-M4 based microprocessor. Towards the top here, you can see we have a couple of these MS5351M clock generator and voltage control oscillators. And a QFN chip here, that's an 8641, which is a single pole four throw RF switch, which can operate up to 2.7 gigahertz. Now, given the frequency range, this is probably used to switch the IF sections. And the A-pin chip next to it, that's a GS8722, which is a general purpose rail-to-rail -rail dual op amp. Now, it appears all these shielding cans are just clipped on, so they are probably easy to remove. Let me try pry one of these off. Very carefully. And now it is almost off. And now we can take these cans off. So I'm going to remove the rest of these. And once the shielding cans are removed, it became really clear that the architecture and ICs used here are almost identical to those used in the Nano VNA-FV3 I reviewed not too long ago. As you can see here, the circuitry under port 1 shielding can, which is for S11 measurement, looks very similar to what we have in the Nano VNA-FV3. We have the same RF transformers arrangements, but we do have an extra QFN chip. I don't recognize this QFN chip. Maybe someone more familiar with QFN markings can provide a comment below. But my thought is that this may be an attenuator chip. As you recall, we can change the signal output power from channel 1 on this VNA. Now let me move up a little bit. You can see the synthesizer used here is identical to what's in the Nano VNA-FV3, which is a MAX2870, 23.5 MHz to 6 GHz fractional and integer N synthesizer and VCO. This is pretty much what I suspected earlier, given that the SV6301A has largely the same frequency range and RF characteristics as the Nano VNA-FV3. Now let's take a look at the port 2 circuitry. Port 2, which is for S21 measurement, is pretty much identical to what we saw in the Nano VNA-FV3. The chip used here is an ADL5801 active mixer, which has a frequency range between 10 MHz and 6 GHz. And the IF input into the mixer must be coming into the second MAX2870E next to port 2, as you can see here. So the hardware performance of this SV6301A is largely the same as the Nano VNA-FV3. There may be slight benefit of using a large PCB for the RF section as the separation between the two channels are probably slightly better given the increased physical distance between the two ports. But all the components are essentially the same. So the much higher price you pay for the SV6301A is mainly for the larger touch screen and added software capability. Now, can these features be implemented in the Nano VNA-FV3 or even the V2? Well, unlike the SV6301A, those Nano VNAs don't have a dedicated application processor, so the performance may not be as good. But conceivably, the bells and whistles on this VNA can be ported to other Nano VNAs as well. Now, I have to say, though, it is a joy to use the SV6301A as the user interface is much more elegant and the 7-inch touchscreen is definitely a nice upgrade. In my opinion, though, the biggest competitor to this SV6301A is none other than Sysjoin's own Nano VNA-FV3, as after all, the main RF circuitry is identical. 
Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Your participation is what makes videos like this possible. I will catch up to you next time.